hello world, what is up? Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Matt Forte. We are here live at the Build Studio in New York City. Uh, this December, Social Bite co-founder Josh Littlejohn, MBE, partners with the Malala Fund, UNICEF USA, and the Institute for Global Homelessness to help homeless and displaced people around the world. Uh, the campaign aims to see 50,000 participants sleep out globally to raise a target of $50 million in funding for homelessness and refugee causes. Here to tell me all about what is being called the largest charitable fundraising campaign in a generation. I've got Social Bite co-founder Josh Littlejohn and president and CEO of UNICEF USA, Carol Stern, in the building. How you feel about that, folks? I'm excited. Are you guys excited as well? You should be. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, we're going to bring them out in just a moment. But first, I believe we have a video telling us all about the world's big sleep out. So let's go ahead and run that clip. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, please round of applause, Carol Stern and Josh Little John, right here. Let's go. Come on. Uh, guys, thank you so much uh, for, for being here, for, for the work that you guys are doing, for this amazing effort. I'm very excited to talk to both of you. Uh, we'll get into all the details, how this came to be, all that. But first and foremost, how are you guys doing? How are you feeling right now? How's today going so far? I'm great. I just flew in from uh, Scotland last night, so I love being in New York, uh, and this is super exciting uh, to be here and see the world's big sleep out logo there. And thanks to you guys all for coming. So yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. Well, well, that's very exciting. I didn't realize you flew out last night. That's very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for being here. And Carol, where did you fly from? I no, drove I'm kidding. In, you know, LA this morning. You know, <laughs> but I mean, harrowing experience harrowing, nonetheless. Totally harrowing <laughs> experience. Yes, yeah, from Bayside. Yeah. Uh, well, you know what? Let's dig in. Uh, I, I want to start uh, with you and with Social Bite. And just for those that aren't familiar with uh, what sets Social Bite apart from other businesses and kind of what inspired you to, to sort of take that approach, if you just give us a little bit of background, a little bit of context. Yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a bit surreal, really, to be here in New York talking to you about this because this all had very humble origins and we certainly didn't dream of anything like this on, on such a global scale. Um, the whole thing started for us about seven years ago. I co-founded this little business in Scotland called Social Bite. It actually started as a little cafe, sort of coffee sandwich shop in the centre of Edinburgh. Um, and originally the idea, to be honest, didn't have anything to do with the homelessness issue. Um, but what happened was we met this young man who was 19 years old. He was homeless. He was selling this magazine on the street corner outside the front door of our little cafe. And after about two weeks, he came into the shop this day and he plucked up the courage and he asked us if he could have a job. Um, so we kind of thought... Why not? It seemed like a nice thing to do, and we gave him a job in our kitchen. Um, basically, he worked very hard. We saw the employment was very transformative for him, and we thought, we'll try it again. So we asked this guy, Pete, if he knew anybody else that was homeless and that might want a job, and he suggested his brother, Joe. Um, so we gave Joe a job. He worked hard. Another job came up, and they recommended someone else. Almost by accident, really, we started to offer jobs to homeless people, um, and that kind of got us started in that world. We then sort of introduced this service in the cafe where customers could pay it forward um, and maybe people started to buy extra sandwiches or coffees for people that were homeless to get something for free. And again, almost before we'd realized it, we started to feed about 40 or 50 people every day in this little cafe. Um, so that was the origins about seven years ago. And over the last seven years, we've really sort of expanded our work. Uh, and now this is the first year we're, we're trying to do something on an international scale. Global scale. Um, we just The thing I was always fascinated about, the early origins of Social Bite, when, was it difficult to get it off the ground when you explained to people that the intention of Social Bite was to enact social change? It wasn't a business that was designed to make tons and tons of money and make profit as much as it was to give back to the community. Was, was it hard to get buy-in on that when you were starting a business? Starting a business is hard no matter what, much less one that you, you want to impact such a wonderful change. Yeah, well, we were inspired by this guy when we got started called Professor Muhammad Yunus. Um, so this is a guy that's based out in Bangladesh. Uh, he's an amazing man. He won the Nobel Peace Prize and uh, and so on. So, and I, I came up, stumbled across a book he wrote where he described an idea that he called a social business. Um, so he talked about how in his native Bangladesh, he set up over 50 different companies and some of them went on to become really large billion dollar businesses. Um, but he'd never owned a single share in any one of them. So it, it was 
a completely different motivation from the traditional one of maximizing a return for himself or for investors. But he kept seeing these social challenges in Bangladesh. And his solution every time was to create a business format to tackle that particular problem. So I was reading this book about eight, nine years ago and thinking, wow, what an inspiring idea. So uh, we kind of thought maybe if we could set up this little cafe and it had a bit of a social mission, um, then maybe you know customers might come, come and choose us. So that was our inspiration. But as I say, the original concept we'd wanted to make a difference but it wasn't focused on the homelessness issue yeah. um, at that time no you were going to shine that light it, on it yeah kind of presented itself to you exactly so if that young man pete hadn't came in and asked us for a job on that day then you know we would have been maybe on a completely different path and i would certainly not be here speaking to you yeah. Carol, when did you and, and, and the people at unicef become aware of josh's work and, and how did you come to be involved this year at the international level so my first familiarity with Josh's work was reading about it in an article, but Josh literally call, cold called me. I mean, I just got this phone call saying, well, I have this idea, and I'd really like to talk to you about it. And he had this crazy idea to take the sleep out they've been doing in Edinburgh and do it globally. Yeah. And to do it in the United States, they needed a US partner. And also, as we started to talk about homelessness, and obviously talking about homelessness here in New York in particular, but then we really started to talk about my definition of homelessness, which is children on the move. We've got 70 million kids today wandering the earth, who, you know, more than half of whom have been forcibly removed from their homes due to conflict. So, you know, we started to talk about how might we do something that could address both, and we could draw the world's attention to the idea that everybody deserves a safe, comfortable place to put their head at night. Yeah. Uh, Josh, was that one of the first times that uh, sort of your definition of homelessness had been expanded or started to evolve and grow in those conversations with Carol? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, our focus over the last seven years has been very local um, in Scotland. You know, we, we expanded our chain of cafes and we opened five cafes in three cities in Scotland. Um, the inspiration to this World's Big Sleep Out event has been something we've done in Scotland called Sleep in the Park uh, over the last two years. So over the last two years, we've had about 18,000 people from all over the country come together and sleep out en masse uh, to raise money and awareness on a cold Saturday night. Uh, they've slept out and they've raised about $10 million over the last two years um, through, through these events. But that's all been very focused on the homelessness issue locally. Um, so when we decided we wanted to try and take that concept and everything that was so positive about it, and the idea was on a one-off basis, so not something we want to repeat, um, but try to create a one-off, unique, global moment in time to focus the world's attention on the homelessness issue and to try and raise a very substantial sum of money. When I started speaking to Carol and we were looking at it more from that global perspective, it made sense to really broaden the definition of homelessness so that we're looking out for people on the streets as we all see people in New York and throughout American cities and throughout the world, um, but also, as Carol says, to the 70 million children that are displaced um, and on the move throughout the world as well. Carol, it's being called, I said this earlier in my introduction, I read this online, a lot of people calling it one of the uh, one of the largest uh, movements, one of the largest events of its kind in a generation. You know, you've been with UNICEF for over a decade now, and your experience, it, the scale of this, is it on par with some of the stuff you've seen before? Is it one of the biggest things you've ever worked on? What it is one of the biggest. You know, I, I think what's really interesting about it is we're allowing people to, you know, everybody who gives a dollar always wants to be able to trace that dollar. And the model that Josh has created allows them to to designate in the United States the charity they want the dollar to go to, with 35% of it going to UNICEF to distribute to the children around the globe. But the idea that we're raising awareness, we're also providing an opportunity. You don't have to sleep out in Times Square or in the parks that have been designated for some of the other cities in the US. You can do it yourself. Yeah. You know, mom and dad can bring their kids and sleep out in the backyard. Yeah. Um, it's just a really good opportunity to have that conversation I deal with asking people to find their humanity every day, and that's what this is really about. You know, you mentioned uh, how parents can bring their kids into the backyard and do it. I, one of the only reasons, if not the biggest reason, that I'm as familiar as I am with UNICEF is because as a child growing up, oh, the harbinger of <laughs> Halloween, I knew it was Trick coming. Or treat in for class, UNICEF. we would get we our little box. With the, yeah, yeah. I, I was reading about it to see, like, is this still happening? How disconnected am I? And I was amazed to see that uh, you guys introduced, uh, like, text message donations. You've introduced all these different ways to sort of evolve even that program. How important has it been to evolve? Evolve the, the programs that engage children as what they're interested in has evolved and as that's changed over the years. Has that been challenging for you guys over at UNICEF? Well, 
you know, obviously everything has to evolve. So, yeah. but I think what's exciting is UNICEF was founded on the belief that we don't only serve children, but we are, their voice should be participative in how we do that. Yeah. And so trick or treat for UNICEF for a whole lot of people is the first time that a kid ever gets to give back. And it doesn't require mom to write a check. You know, yeah. this isn't, you know, but you bake the cake. This is go door to door. And if you're, you know, unselfish enough to say, I'll give up my candy for a few pennies. And um, we raise a, oh, between three and four million dollars a year. And But I will also tell you that we did a survey of our major donors about, probably about five years ago and found that over 70% of them had trick-or-treated for UNICEF as a child. Yeah. And one in 10 Americans today has trick-or-treated for UNICEF. I noticed you said if you're not selfish, you'll say, I'll give up my candy. Was I supposed to be giving up candy? Well, it, no, I, 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 was really, I was helping myself. I was there, working you know, every house so. over for everything they had. I was getting candy. <laughs> I was getting change. Josh, is this completely foreign to you? Are you under... Are are you familiar with what we're talking about? I don't know if this is a global uh, concept or not that UNICEF does this, but it was very big for me as a I've child. Not heard, I think Halloween's much bigger in America than yes. it is the rest of the world, so that's probably a U.S. thing, but you know, it sounds yeah. great. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, essentially, you're familiar with the idea of trick-or-treating. UNICEF, we'd get these little boxes, and we'd go door-to-door, -door and, and we'd collect money to donate, and it was just, it, we, you were right, you felt responsible. I remember as a kid feeling like this was something I, I, I was proud to do because I was doing it, and I was and making Not only that, you really are saving a life. I mean, yeah. the average box is about $2.20, and $1 buys enough good, clean drinking water for a child for 20 days. Yeah. So I go into classrooms all over America, and I tell kids, you fill that box, you will have saved a life. Yeah. So it's a pretty cool thing to do. It is pretty cool. Now, to that end, getting children involved. Josh, have you guys seen what what who gets involved when you guys do these sleepouts? What kind of people come out to support the cause? Are you seeing a, a, a wide range of ages? Are you are you seeing specific demographics? What kind of people come out? Yeah, it's an amazing uh, people from all sections of society, really. So you know, we approach people from the business community and the top chief executives, but also we go to the high schools and get uh, high school kids involved to either come to the main events or we're also encouraging people to host their own sleep out so yeah. high school kids can do it in their school um, playing fields and so on and so forth university students church groups you know every, everyday families so this is something that everyone can really participate in I saw uh, and you're right you can do it anywhere you can do anything but you do have some incentive to go to a couple different places Times Square Trafalgar Square particularly you have uh, Will Smith will be here correct uh, yeah, <laughs> reading a bedtime story is what I understand. Yeah, so this is something we did in Scot. This events in Scotland, we had um, a bit of a concert element before people sleep out. Yeah. Um. So in Scotland, we we had different musicians performing stripped back sets, and then we had the comedian John Cleese uh, came and told a bedtime story, and this is something that. Oh. Help to drum up a bit of it. Yeah. Fine, right? Yeah. <laughs> no offense to Will Smith, but come on. <laughs> John, John Cleese. in a bedtime story? That's a perfect person. That yeah. voice. Yeah. I'm sure Will Smith's going to be great. <laughs> it's Will Smith. Yeah. He can't not be great. Totally. But so that's amazing. So here we've got Will Smith doing it yeah. here, uh, and Dame Helen Mirren doing the same thing in London, um, which should be fun, yeah. And if you guys, if people can't make it, are there ways for them to, if they're hosting their own, like, sanctioned uh, sleep out, can they get, like, a feed of that? Can they see that? Can they hear that? How does that work? How can they still be a part of it if they're not in New York? So Will Smith and Helen Mirren, and I'm sure lots of other people, um, have agreed to record a little message and a, and a story and so on that's going to go around all the events throughout the world. So it doesn't matter if you're doing it with your family in your back garden or if you're doing it somewhere else in the world. Um, you'll get a, a message from them wherever you are for sure. You guys, uh, you know, social bites attracted attention. George Clooney, uh, the, the royal family. People have been, there's been eyes on you guys for a while. What, what did you, how did you guys feel when you found out that Dame Helen Mirren was going to join the, the party and help you guys out and work? That, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, there's been, to be honest, the, 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 throughout this campaign, there's been so much stuff that's amazing. That That's absolutely brilliant. Um, I was speak, managed to speak to her the other day, and she said she's going to do the bedtime story, a scene from Fast and the Furious, uh, which, really? which should be cool. Um, but yeah, but I mean, even, you know, the, the, probably the most amazing thing for me is that we've managed to get Times Square as a venue here in New York. Um, and yeah, that, w when I first approached uh, in New York, I, w I didn't really know anybody who hadn't met Carol at this stage. Um, so I kind of picked up the phone and basically cold called the New York City Parks Department. Say, how do you call New York? Who'd you call? Yeah, well, so yeah. The Parks Department. So it was pretty speculative. Yeah. So I was sat and I Googled it, New York Parks, and then I found a phone number for the Parks Department. I phoned them up and said, um, you know, I was sat in Edinburgh, and I said, this is what we've done in Scotland. We'd love to do something in New York. How would we go about applying for a permit? And the guy said, look, that'll be completely impossible to do that in New York. He said, you know, there's no precedent for overnight events. The NYP 
PD would never sign this off. He said, it's just no chance, go to another city. Um, so I was like, oh man. So I ended up coming out here about a month later. This was maybe nine months ago, eight months ago. Um, and I set up lots of very speculative random meetings. And I ended up meeting this one guy who said, I must introduce you to my friend Bruce. So I met his friend Bruce the next day. And this guy turned out to be the former chief of staff to Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Um, so I told him about what we wanted to do, and he was a really energetic New Yorker, and he was like, Josh, we love this, we have to do this here. And he picked up his phone in the meeting, and he phoned someone in City Hall, and he said, you've got to give this guy 10 minutes tomorrow about this homeless thing. Um, so the next day I went to City Hall, told him about it, and to my amazement, they started to say, it would be a bit difficult, but a venue that might work here might be Times Square. Um, so I was like, wow. So I kind of jumped on that, and to my amazement, it's ended up happening, so yeah. That's pretty incredible, dude. Got to respect uh, the hustle to like <laughs> that, that you were told no, but you came out here anyway and you kept pressing it. And now here we are. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And it's testament, I think, to the spirit of New York that, you know, it's a bit of an adventurous spirit yeah. you've got here. And I think people just kind of took to the idea. And I think, you know, that one of the main objectives that I spoke with Carol about from the early stage was not just as a fundraiser, but to really draw attention, uh, you know, draw, draw the media spotlight to the issue of homelessness, the political spotlight, raise a sense of political urgency. So what better venue in the world to have a couple of thousand people sleeping out in order to do that than Times Square? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's not just a testament to you. It's a testament to you, dude. That's pretty amazing. I mean, you think about uh, all these, it's grown exponentially year after year. It's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Have, has any thought been given to what do you do next year? How do you get bigger than global? How, what do you do next? Well, I mean, the, the thing about this is it's um, billed purposefully as a one-off event. So this is like, in my mind, hopefully a bit of a live aid moment around the issue of homelessness. So we, we have no plans to repeat it. Uh, we've got obviously Times Square. There's 50 cities throughout the world taking part this year, everywhere from New Delhi in India to Manila in the Philippines to Dublin, Ireland to Madrid, all around the world. So we want to do this. The target's to raise $50 million. And then after that, I'm going back to Scotland and selling sandwiches again. That's my plan. <laughs> It's not a bad plan. Speaking about looking ahead, we got to go in just a second to audience Q&A. But, Carol, I'd, be, uh, I'd hate to not bring up. Congratulations are in order. I saw very recently it was Thank announced. You. After, Thank you. Yeah, all your time with UNICEF, you've got a pretty incredible opportunity lined up for next year. I this is an do. amazing way. This is one heck of a swan song. My to work last on. day of work. Yeah, is it really? It's your <laughs> yep. last day. Yep. Wow, what a way to go. What a cherry on top of the Sunday. Um, how, so what does that do to this project for you? This is the last big hurrah. Uh, what is that like for you uh, working on this? You know, I, will, I just met with my staff yesterday to share the news with them because the announce was announced on Monday. Um, I've had the most amazing almost 13 years at the home of UNICEF USA, and, and I did not think there was anything I could possibly do next that could come close. And so I really wanted to do something different. And I'm very, very excited. I, I have been offered and accepted to be the executive director of the Walton Family Foundation. And to be in a position now to use the, the family values, the family name, to bring about some real change in the world is really exciting. Very, very I mean, exciting. very exciting. Well, congratulations. Uh, the world's big sleep out, the main event, December 7th, Times Square in New York. There's cities all over all over the world. Uh, I think it was a bigsleepout.com. Big sleep, yeah, is where you can go yeah. and register and stuff like that. Uh, get more information. Uh, if you're going to come out and join us in New York, fantastic. If you want to do one in your backyard, that's even better as well. Bigsleepout.com for all that information. Uh, Kate, do I have some? I got two questions. Let's get to them. I got one question right now in the room. You've got a microphone. Hi there. Go for it. Uh, first of all, thank you for everything that you're doing. It's such important work. Um, I wanted to ask, what do you think is the biggest misconception about homelessness that maybe not that many people are, are aware of that you wish they were? Thank you. Um, yeah, so as I say, we got involved in it by accident. So we had a lot of preconceived ideas around homelessness ourselves when we started. And I think probably the biggest one is that people kind of think, uh, you know, it's their own fault. Uh, you know, maybe they've got they're addicts or they become alcoholics or that kind of thing. But what became apparent to us when we started to offer these people jobs in our little cafe is we always asked them after some time, how did you become homeless and learn their story? And it became a bit spooky almost because almost it seemed to whoever we asked, no matter how many people we asked, their story always was traced back to their childhood um, and they typically suffered 
pretty traumatic uh, childhoods. They typically didn't grow up in the same situation that I or most of us did, um, with stable, loving, loving families, but grew up through the care system and in children's homes, and more often than not became homeless in their late teenage years. There's a big overlap between homelessness and addiction, you know, as a lot of people know, but the cause and effect between homelessness and addiction is often the reverse way around. So addiction often follows homelessness rather than the, the other way around. And I think if, you know, you can imagine yourself, if you were sleeping on the streets of New York day in, day out, or in ho homelessness shelters or whatever, then a lot of people would turn to drink or drugs as a sort of escape. So I think it's that whole thing about finding our humanity, our compassion, and understanding that these people were simply dealt different cards than what most of us were. I think also, you know, to really expand that definition beyond our, our kind of usual urban homelessness, you know, that um, the children that UNICEF works with, many of them didn't leave home by choice um, or because of finances, but because of conflict through decisions that we as adults have made that have impacted their lives. and whether that's fleeing Syria and they're finding themselves on a long walk, um, coming out of Latin America on another long walk, or forced out of Myanmar and into Bangladesh. You know, there are all of these children, who, many of whom don't even begin to comprehend why this is happening to them, and all they want is a place that feels safe. That's a great question. Thank you. Katie, I have time for one more. I'd love to get one more question. Let's go for it right over here. Hi. Um, so I was just wondering, as you guys tackle uh, this issue at an international scale, um, I was wondering what it's like to try to comprehend and assist on an issue you recognize, but in a different context of a different nation, and if there was any social or legislative obstacles abroad that you didn't expect. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting, and I'm. it's been so interesting to spend more time in America uh, and understand the situation a bit more here. Um, as I say, our expertise has historically been very local. But spending time in New York, you know, I learned that I think there's about 66,000 men, women, and many children in shelters here in New York. So it's a massive, massive challenge for the city. But I've also spent a bit of time in the west coast of America. I've been to San Francisco, Los Angeles, which I know is extremely prominent in the news right now with Donald Trump, you know, putting, putting a focus on it. And, you know, when I was in San Francisco... It almost felt apocalyptic, it felt dystopian. You know, there was just people lying on the streets everywhere you walked. Um, so it's been a massive eye-opener, actually, to see the scale of the challenge that we have here in America. Um, I think there's certainly global trends and global similarities, and I think there's uh, solutions that we can understand from best practice, uh, but it really requires a sense of collaboration on it. I think us as citizens need to show compassion, we need to demand change from our political leaders and I think we all kind of need to come together and try and give these people a, a hand up and in our, my experience if you do that then they can come into their own and thrive like anyone else can but too often they kind of get left behind uh, and cut adrift from society. Uh, okay, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you for your question as well. Uh, I, I want to close things out just by echoing the sentiments of, of our audience here and that thank you for not just being here, but the incredible work that you've done uh, over both of you over the last decade. The way, Josh, everything that you started with, that your very humble beginnings, now here you are at a global scale trying to implement solutions. And, and, and Carol, everything you've done with UNICEF over the years. I was reading about, you, in your time, you doubled what UNICEF uh, brings in and does. You've done incredible work over there. Thank so both you. of you Thank have contributed so greatly uh, to this world and to its people. And, and it's just super awesome and an honor to have you here today. I want to remind everyone, uh, bigsleepout.com uh, and look up the world's Big Sleep Out and get involved. Uh, it's an, an incredible cause. We should all be involved. And honestly, Will Smith's going to be there. Sounds like it's actually going to be a pretty fun night. Uh, and, and we'll do a lot of good together. So uh, thank you again, everyone. Please thank uh, Carol Stern and Josh Littlejohn for being here. Come on, do it up. Thank you. Let's go. Thanks, Thanks for having us, really. Great.